welcome everyone. It's good to see you here on a Wednesday night. I always believe it takes a special individual and a special family to come out on a Wednesday night. So give yourself a round of applause because you made it. If you're working, then you made it home. You got, you got off work, made it home. I'm not sure if you had time to eat or shower, but you got the kids ready, got them in the car, raced over here. Some of you still had time to get some Starbucks, still got here to church and got to praise God. Amen. Amen. So kudos to you because you're here on a Wednesday night. And I believe that God was doing something in your life as we were worshiping. I believe that chains were being broken. Amen. I believe God was speaking to you. I believe that you were finding hope. And with that same spirit and that same heart, I do believe that God has a word for you. I know but God has a word for me. And at the community, I do believe that we're going to be encouraged, and I do believe that God's going to be able to pour into our life in ways that we need it the most. And isn't it amazing that God has a way of speaking to us um, that only he can be able to do? Only he can be able to speak into our life the way we need it the most, the way we need to hear it. And I don't know what's going on in your lives individually, but God always has a way of speaking into your circumstance um, in a timely manner. And if you guys are grateful for God speaking to you because he's alive, because he is well, why don't you put your hands together because we serve a God that cares enough to speak into our life. He cares enough. Uh, for those who don't know, my name, Dan, my name is Danny, and I'm honored to be a pastor here at Hope Chapel. And every single week we look at the gospel. We look at the scriptures because it is our owner's manual. The Bible says that it is a double-edged sword. It has life. It is active. It is purposeful. And we need it every single day. I grew up believing that I need a Proverbs a day to get along with people. I need a Psalms a day to get along with God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We need the gospel every single day. You guys can take that with you. It's I need a Proverbs a day to get along with people. I need a Psalms a day to get along with God. Because the Bible has a way of rejuvenating our spirits. It has a way of rejuvenating our souls, and, and it has a way of, it's a mirror, because it allows to look and reflect at ourselves, to readjust, to show us how we need to respond in certain circumstances. And I don't know about you, but I got a devil to fight every single day, because the things that we are doing for the Lord, the devil is not happy. He wants to keep you and your family incarcerated and hostage to a moment in the past. He doesn't want you to move forward. But we have a God that uh, the Bible tells us that greater is he that greater is in me than he that is in the world. And we can rejoice because of that. We can rejoice because the gospel speaks to individual, individuals all around the world and you're included in that. And I'm just so grateful for his word. And you know why I'm so grateful because of it? Because we have access to it as as often as we choose to open up our gospel, open up our Bibles, and just declare God's word and his promises over our life. And it's so enriching. It's so enriching. He is our daily bread. So we do it every single week because we find it important and because we need to be rejuvenated and we need to be encouraged. And today we're going to be looking at a portion of scripture. We're going to be talking about Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And we're not going to necessarily focus so much on the crucifixion. But I want to, I want to pinpoint on, on a group of ladies that were, that were present during Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And how they can teach us how to respond in certain circumstances in our life. Amen. I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 23. And we're going to read verses 50 all the way down to verses 56. So four, six verses for you tonight. Luke chapter 23, verses 50 down to verse 56. And when you're there, say, I am there. We've got one person that is there tonight. If you don't have a Bible, then we're going to display on the words on the screen for you. So therefore, you can follow along. Aren't you guys grateful that we have volunteers that get here at 6 a.m. to make sure you have the scriptures on the screen for you to be able to follow along. That's Luke chapter 23, verses 50 down to verse 56. My Bible titles this portion of scripture, Jesus is buried. Everybody say, Jesus is buried. Jesus is buried. Luke chapter 23, I'm going to be reading out the ESV version. Your version might be slightly different than mine, but we all believe that it's God's word at the end of the day. Amen. I may drop out, but you can go ahead and continue along in case I don't know how to say a specific word. We read the gospel in the name of the Father, Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Verse 50 says it like this. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of 
Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. I like that. I have that highlighted in my Bible. He was a good and righteous man. Already, I want to be like Joseph. I want to be like Joseph. Verse 51, who had not consented to their decision and action. We'll talk about that. Again, verse 50. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. Man, I want to be like Joseph when I grow up. Who had not consented to their, to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down from the cross and wrapped it in linen there you go, church. I'm making sure y'all with me. And laid him in a tomb, cut in stone, where no one had ever been laid. It was a day of the preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. That's important, that the Sabbath was beginning. Verse 55, the woman, the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandments. Let us read verse 55 and verse 56 together. Verse 55 says this. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandments. I titled this message, when there's nothing else you can do. My objective of the sermon tonight is at the end of the sermon is for us to be able to see the way these women responded when they felt there was absolutely nothing they can do when they saw Jesus be buried. Because the reality is, is that we will, go, we will, see, we will face moments in our life where we feel like there's nothing we can do. And when we feel helpless and when we've ran out of ideas, when there's no speech that we can give or if we've ran out of options, what do we do when we feel there's nothing else we can do? Look at your neighbor, remind them of the title of this message, when there's nothing else you can do. Let us pray, God. We thank you so much for this opportunity, God. Thank you, God, for allowing us to have a space, Father, where we can come in and be together to give you honor and to give you praise. As we continue with this service, God, as we continue with this experience, we ask you, Jesus, God, that you will invade, God, until we go home, Father. I pray that you will speak to us, Jesus, God. If, if there's anybody here who is hopeless, I pray that tonight they will find hope in you and your word and in your gospel and in your promises. I pray tonight, God, that you will fill us up with faith. You will fill us up with encouragement, God. When we feel like we're in a season where our back's up against the wall and we ran out of options that we want to give up, God, we pray, God, that you will give us the motivation, give us the grace to continue moving forward, God. We pray, God Almighty, that you will speak to us in a way only you can speak to us, God. Eradicate any pain emotionally. Eradicate any sadness, God, that's lingering within us, God. And we just rebuke the devil right now in the name of Jesus, God, and we proclaim and declare that he will not have his way with our marriages, Father. He won't have his way, God, with our children. He won't have his way with with our household. He won't have our way with our schools and our city and our churches and our states and our nation, God. We declare this place to be holy ground, Father. In Jesus' name, God, we give you the honor. We give you the glory, God. And if we're not inviting you, God, then we're just making noise, Father. You are to be at the center of this service, God, because we want this to be a Christ-centered community, a Christ-centered service, and a Christ-centered church to give you all the honor and all the glory that you so deserve, God. In Jesus' In Jesus' name we pray, and the church says, amen. and the church says, amen. amen and amen. Hey, how many of you guys know you can learn a lot from other people? Yeah. You probably have people in your life that you can learn a lot from. There's other people in your life that maybe you, maybe not so much. But even, even if we're not learning a lot from people, uh, one of my favorite quotes that's out there, it says, a smart person learns from his or her own mistakes. But a wise person learns from others' mistakes. And there's going to be people in our life who maybe you've already experienced this yourself where they've made mistakes and they'll tell you, hey, hey, Danny, don't, don't do this. 
You know, I have my father who I, I'm grateful I have him in my life and he's become my best friend. And he'll tell me, man, when I was younger, I should have did this different. When I was younger, I should have trusted in the Lord a little bit more. Uh, when I was your age, and he'll speak into my life, and I love that because he's telling me, he'll, he'll tell me, you can save yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of headache if you just listen to wise counsel. And hey, I don't know about you, but I'm all for avoiding some heartache and some headache in my life. But on the contrary to that, there's also good things that people have done that will speak into your life. There's, there's good decisions that they've made. They're not necessarily mistakes or nor are they necessarily regrets. But uh, you may have some people in your life that speak into your life and they talk about certain career choices that they made that, that ended up being beneficial for them. Or maybe there are certain investments that people made that they want to pass down the knowledge and that wisdom. Because it doesn't necessarily take someone to, take, to make mistakes for us to learn. But also, um, they can be doing good things for us to be able to learn and absorb that as well. Because the truth is that there are people out there making good choices and they can pass that knowledge down as well. The reason why I bring that up to you this evening is because there are these ladies in the Bible who make great choices. And I want to highlight what they do. I want to highlight how they respond. So therefore, when we find ourselves in seasons and we find ourselves in circumstances that we don't know what to do. Have you ever been there? We don't know how to respond. When we feel helpless and when we want to hang up the gloves and throw in a towel, we ask ourselves, what is the next step? I want us to be able to glean from these women where we can be able to see this is how I move forward. We find ourselves in Luke chapter 23 and these, these ladies we see, they, they come from Galilee. And just for us to be able to understand what these ladies are going through, these ladies were followers of Jesus Christ. These ladies were people who he impacted. These ladies are people that he, he reached. And I even believe, believe that these ladies could have been ladies that he maybe made a miracle in their life and their hearts are broken because here is the Messiah of the world. Here is the, the hope of the world. Here is the, the Savior of the world. And here he is dead before their very eyes. And in order for us to be able to understand their distress and, and their anguish, we have to know that uh, the context of Luke chapter 23, uh, Jesus Christ, about a week ago, on a Sunday, he, he, he travels into Jerusalem. And by Thursday, he's arrested about 9 p.m. Everybody say 9 p.m. He comes into Jerusalem about Sunday, and he, he's arrested about Thursday, about 9 p.m., and he's crucified on Friday about noontime, about 12, and he's dead on the cross by, by 3 p.m. Again, he comes into Jerusalem on, on a Sunday. He's arrested about Thursday, about 9 p.m., and then he's dead on the cross by, by 3 p.m. And then you have to ask yourself, what was the urgency from the Sanhedrin council? Because the San Hedra Council, here's what they did between Thursday 9 p.m. and Friday 3 p.m. They all gathered together to make sure that they pressured and they pushed Jesus towards the cross. Again, from Thursday from 9 p.m. and Friday from uh, 12 p.m., they made sure that Jesus Christ was pressured and pushed towards the cross. You have to ask yourself, what was the rush and what was the, the sense of urgency and the Sanhedrin council members cons uh, had about 72 members in it, and they met at night, which at that time was illegal. And you know this was probably a hard thing to do, because it's hard to get that many people to be on the same page that late at night for that, am for that amount of hours. But that shows us the urgency they wanted to press and push Jesus Christ towards crucifixion. The time was ticking, which ends up leading Jesus Christ being beaten. It ends up Jesus Christ being stripped and forces him to carry a cross that was about 120 pounds down a street called the Via Della Rosa up the mountain of Golgotha, where he will eventually be crucified by 12 p.m. and dead by 3 p.m. The time was ticking. But why the sense of urgency? 
Because the Bible tells us that the Passover was getting ready to begin. And according to Jewish culture, what people would do on the Passover is they would go back to their hometown. So thousands of people were in Jerusalem. And if the Sanhedrin council members can crucify Jesus Christ publicly, then maybe when these people go back home to their respected homes, then maybe they can spread the news that Jesus Christ was dead. And once and for all, this Jesus movement will finally come to an end. Not only were they in a rush, but the Bible now introduces us to Luke chap in Luke chapter 23 to this man named Joseph. Joseph, who was part of the council, was in disagreement to uh, what, they had, um, what they had decided. And he ends up going to Pilate, and he asked permission if he can take Jesus Christ's body uh, to a tomb to lay him to rest. And Pilate gives him permission. And so uh, in order for us to understand what's going on in, in Joseph's life, Joseph has to uh, go get a ladder and climb up the, 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 the cross. And he has to take Jesus Christ off the cross. He has to come back down that ladder. And he has to wrap his body in such a way where it's honorable for a man who was of significance of that time. And he has to seal him in that tomb um, all before the sun comes down. And the reason why is because the next day church was the Sabbath day. Everybody say the Sabbath day. Sabbath. And Jewish people do not lift a finger on a Sabbath day. According to culture and according to historians, they do not work on a Sabbath day. So not only were the Sanhedrin council members rushing to press and push Jesus Christ towards crucifixion, but also Joseph finds himself in a rush because he has to bring Jesus Christ down. He has to wrap his body in a specific way, and then he has to make sure that he seals him inside of a tomb all before sun, the sun comes down, which then leads us to a group of women who follow Jesus from Galilee which is the premise of tonight's sermon. These women come from Galilee, which allows us to see that they didn't just miraculously, miraculously happen to be there. They just aren't there out of happenstance. They're not just there out of uh, coincidence. No, they're there because they follow Jesus to the very end. And I love this because I like to believe that amongst those people was Jesus' mother, Mary. I think amongst his people was also Mary Magdalene, people who followed Jesus to the very end. Not only was Mary, his mother there, not only was Mary Magdalene his there, but I like to believe that Mary and Martha, some of his best friends were there as well. And when I get to heaven, I want to ask God, was the lady who bled for 12 years present at that time, Jesus? Because I want to say that she was, but I'm not certain. What about Jerry's daughter, the, the girl who you made a miracle in her life? Was, was she there as well? Because I want to say that she was, but I'm not certain. What about the lady that you met in John chapter 4, and you sat on a well with her, the Samaritan woman, and you impacted her life in such a way where she went back into her city and had such a significant role in her city and led people onto salvation. I hope that they were there. But if they were not there, church, then that's, I also don't judge them because sometimes I also forget about the things and how way, the ways God has moved in my life that I have to be able to look back at the history that I have with God and remind myself the miracles that he's made for me. I got to look back in life and, and remind ourselves how he's opened doors and, and praise him for the doors he closed. God, I, sometimes I got to look back in life and I got to remind myself of the promises that he fulfilled and provided for me in such a way that it is my motivating factor to make sure that I also follow Jesus until the very end of my life because it's going to be the love I have for him that propels me to make sure I'm consistent in my walk with Jesus. And I'm here to remind you that God has also moved in your life. You are the recipient of God doing something special. You are the recipient of God opening and and closing doors in your life and we have to some back remember our history so therefore we can continue to be consistent with Jesus Amen. and they follow him until the very end these ladies inspire me but they're also on a time crunch too not also the Sanhedrin on a time crunch not only is Joseph on a time crunch but the time is also ticking for these women because these women they wanted to get involved these women, they wanted to anoint his body. They wanted to bring honor to Jesus Christ. But in order for them to do that, they had to make sure they did it before the sun came down. 
But unfortunately, the sun comes down and they're unable to do what they wanted to do. And all they can do is watch the one that they love get buried. And so what do we do when there's nothing else we can do? The Bible tells us from these ladies that in chapter 23, verse 56, that they go, they go back home. And, and notice what they do. The Bible tells us that they go and they prepare spices and ointments. I love that. They, that they go back and, and un, unfortunately, they're unable to get involved as much as they wanted to. Unfortunately, they're unable to put their input as much as they wanted to. But because, according to custom, they were just happening to watch the one that they love be buried. So what they do do is they go back and they end up preparing spices and ointment. And the word that should pop out to us in this verse is they were preparing. They started preparing. And you and I both know that we don't prepare. Usually we don't prepare for something that just happened. We usually tend to prepare for something that's going to happen so if that means if they went home to prepare that means here's what they did not do they did not go home and have a pity party they did not go home and cry themselves to sleep they did not go home and lay themselves out where they can be soaked in their sorrow no they decided to move in faith and prepare spices and ointments because they knew that the best was still yet to come so what do we do when we feel there's nothing else we can do? It leads me to my first point. You have to prepare for the next chapter. Because these are what the, this is what the ladies are doing. They're getting, ready to, they're getting ready for what's going to happen next. They go home and they prepare spices and they prepare ointments. And I'm here to let you know that if you're still here, that means God's not done with you. If you're still here, that means God still has a plan for your life. If you're still waking up in the morning and you still have air in your lungs and you're still able to go to do what you need to do, it means that God is still working in your life. And I know sometimes things don't happen the way we plan. I know sometimes things don't happen the way we hoped for. And church, I even know that sometimes things don't happen the way we prayed for. But if you're still here, it's because God still has an active purpose in your life. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, because he is not done with you. Yeah. The Bible says that they had to go back home and they had to prepare spices and they had to pres prepare ointments. And let me remind you in which this setting they find themselves in. The sun is coming down. So if they wanted to get this done before the sun comes down, they had to move quickly. They're getting prepared. They're getting prepared while darkness starts to be around them. And you know what happens when darkness starts to be around us? When the sun comes down in our life, when we've ran out of joy, we don't tend to get ready. Oh, no, no, no. We tend to give up. We tend to give up on the next chapter in our life. We tend to throw in a towel. We tend to hang up the gloves because the, we allow the darkness to consume us. We allow the pain to consume us. We allow the anguish and the things that we're distraught in to consume us. But not these ladies. No, no. These ladies are preparing for what is yet to come because they had their faith and their hope that they knew that the next chapter was right around the corner. And I'm here to let you know that if you ran out of joy, if the sun has come down in your life and you've run out of options, God is not done with you as a matter of fact he's preparing you for the next chapter so now you don't have to look at darkness as the dead end you can look at darkness as the indication of a brand new chapter and God is getting ready to flip the page to do something new in Jewish culture as a matter of fact when the sun will come down it was an indication of a brand new day here when the sun comes up it's an indication of a brand new day but not in Jewish culture when the sun comes down it's the start of a new day so if the sun is sun, sun set on your life, God's getting, ready to do, getting, God's getting ready to do something special in your life. I went to the movies over the weekend, and Aline and I, we want to go. Uh, we took my mom out to, to watch Top Gun. I think she's maybe a Tom Cruise fan. I'm not sure, but we took her. And 
We go watch Top Gun, and here I am with my extra large popcorn and my extra large cherry Coke with my uh, extra large bag of Sour Patches and my uh, ice cream cookie sandwich, uh, which I don't plan on sharing with anybody. And so I, I, I'm walking up the steps, and I'm looking for my seats. And you know how you got to kind of put your phone out to make sure what, what you're, you're in the right seat because you don't want to get kicked out halfway through the movie in case someone th gets there late. And so I get there, and I'm with my extra large b box of popcorn and my extra large cherry Coke, my extra large Sour Patches, uh, my, my, my chocolate chip ice cream cookie uh, that I start with as an appetizer, which I don't plan to share. And as we get ready to start the movie, I sit down, and one of my good friends texts me, and he says, do you want to watch Elvis tonight. And I looked at Alina, I was like, do you want to watch Elvis tonight? I mean, we're already here. And so we watch Top Gun, we take my mom back home, and we, we, we realize, you know, we, we don't have kids, and uh, let's enjoy the perks of being young and having little responsibility, and let's go back to the movies and, and watch Elvis. And we go back, and, and we watch Elvis, and as we get there before the previews start, anybody know what I'm talking about? Because the previews is part of the experience. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? We get to before the previews at the start. Before that, we get a Starbucks because, you know, it's, you know, it's a part of the experience, and so, which I plan on not sharing. And we get there, and the previews haven't even started. I look at my good friend. I say, hey, look, I'm going to run down to the bathroom. As soon as the movie starts, give me a call because I do not want to miss the king of rock and roll. So he's like, yeah, of course, absolutely. So I'm like, okay, I'm serious. As soon as the movie starts, give me a call because I don't want to miss this movie. I go down about 30 seconds later, he calls me. He says, hey, the movie's getting ready to start. I said, my man, the previews haven't even started. I just left 30 seconds ago. The movie's not about to start. He says, no, yeah, the movie's getting ready to start. I said, my man, the movie is not getting ready to start. I left about 35 seconds ago. The previews haven't even started. How do you know the movie's getting ready to start? And he says, because the light just went out. And sometimes when the light comes out in our life, it's not because God is done. It's because something's God getting ready to do something in your life. It's because the good news is in, in move. It's because God is getting ready to show you that he is, has given up on your life. But we have a way of indicating that darkness is the end of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a relate, of, of, of our life. But no, God says, no, I'm getting ready to start something new. So these ladies, they go back and they prepare for the next chapter. The Bible also says in that same verse, read it with me, verse 56. It says, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to to the commandments. Not only do we have to prepare for the next chapter, but we have to be persistent in his commandments. The Bible says that they kept the Sabbath. You know why they kept the Sabbath, church? Because it's what God told them to do. Yeah. And have you ever been heartbroken? Have you ever felt maybe disappointed in something God did not do over your life? Yeah. You know what they did? They were heartbroken. And even though they and even though things didn't end up the way they hoped for, even though things didn't end up the way they planned for, and hey, maybe things don't end up the way we prayed for, they still kept the commandments of Jesus. They still chose to walk in obedience to God's word. And you know what happens when we enter seasons of extreme disappointment? We make excuses for disobedience. I'm going to say that one more time so you can tweet it right. You know what happens in seasons of extreme disappointment? We try to find excuses to walk in disobedience. And then we live according to our own terms because God didn't do what you expected him to do. And so we respond saying, well, he's a merciful God. I'm sure he understands. Well, no, God still wants us to walk in obedience even though things aren't going the way we want them to be. Because even if you're heartbroken, I have good news for you. God's word still works. Even if we're set back, God's word still works. Even if you've been um, set back financially, God's word still works. Even, things aren't go even if things are not going the way you want them to. Hey, God's word still works. And as believers of Jesus Christ, you and I, like these women, have the responsibility that even though we don't like the way things are turning out, we don't like the results, we still have the responsibility to walk in obedience to his commandments. So if you're in a season of disappointment, love your neighbor. 
If you're in a season of disappointment, pray without season. If you're in a season of disappointment, then then we got to make sure we're still obedient to God's word. Do not lean on your own understanding, but trust God with all your heart. Be persistent in his commandments. And I think what is killing the church today is people walking away from God when he doesn't move on their behalf. It's almost like we're treating Jesus like he's some type of genie. It's almost like we're training Jesus Christ like he's Santa Claus and he's up in heaven making a list, checking it twice, trying to find out who's. It's as if, if he doesn't work on his half, he's got to work for us. Ladies and gentlemen, we got it upside down. He doesn't work for us. It's us who work for him. Yeah. So even though things aren't going the way we want them to, we still have to be persistent in God's commandments because God's word still works. And if you're walking in worry right now, God's word still works. And we got to be grateful that his word never stops working. Be persistent in his commandments. So we see that these ladies, they prepare for the next chapter. They're persistent in his commandments. And also, point number three, you got to be passive while God is in charge. Be passive while God is in charge. They wanted to get involved. We mentioned that they went back to prepare spices and ointment because they wanted to anoint his body. They wanted to get involved. They wanted their their input. And here's the good news and the bad news. Uh, The bad news is that they didn't make it in time. So all they can do is watch the one that they love, the one that they believed in, be buried. And they couldn't get their hands on the body. So they just had to be bystanders and watch from afar. The bad news is that they they couldn't put their, their input in. They, 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 they couldn't get their, uh, their input. They couldn't get their, their, their hands on Jesus' body. That's, that's, that's the bad news. They, they wanted to. Their, their hearts were in a good place. But according to the Sabbath, the Sabbath said no. That's the bad news. I mean, their hearts were in a good place, you know. They wanted to. They loved him. But God said no, according to the Sabbath. Because Jesus knew he would rise. That's the good news. And have you ever wanted to put your hands on a situation? Have you ever wanted to put your input because of your skills, because of your background, because of you know your capabilities, and and you want to, you know that if you can just get your hands on it, then you can turn things around? And sometimes God says, no, that's that's that feels like the bad news. But here's the good news, that the moment you let off the situation, now God can get his hands on it. Because here's what I want to tell you. God won't touch your situation as long as your hands are on it. And the moment you can let go and release it, God can be able to do what he is able to do. Because the bad news is that if we want to get our hands on it, because we want to save that person. We want us to get our hands on it because we want to change the circumstance. We want to change this situation. But as long as we let go, the good news is now God can be able to say, now I'm able to go to work. Now we can save this person. Now we can see change. Now we can see fruit. Now we can see the solution. Now we can move forward. And it kills us to take our hands off our situation. But if we can just be passive and let God be in charge, then I promise he can do far greater things than we will ever be able to do all you got to do is keep your hands off it and let God take the wheel I took a home ec class in 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 high school freshman year and we were learning to make um homemade rolls Mm -mm -mm, homemade rolls with some garlic somebody say amen Amen. and my home ec teacher Miss Garner from the high school we love you Miss Garner I know you probably watch it online right now (laughs) became a preacher not a cook and uh we were learning how to make uh, dough, and she, she was uh, homemade rolls, and we were, we were messing with, we were kneading the dough. And we had our hands on it, and we were kneading the dough, and, and about, and, and when we were kneading the dough, she says, okay, uh, now take your hands off of it, because you can't overdo it with the dough. And you got to wrap it so that way uh, the yeast can allow, allow it to rise. And that's exactly how God works. The moment you're able to get your hands off of it, 
Now we can see fruit. Now we can see change because now God is able to do what God is able to do. Trust in him. Do not lean on your own strength and your understanding. Let God take the will and watch things rise in your life that you believe were never possible. Amen? Amen. So one, prepare for the next chapter. Not only do they prepare for the next chapter, but they're persistent in God's commandment. And we have to learn to be passive while God is in charge. Here's my final point. I'm going to allow the worship team to come back up. Verse 55 says this. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On a Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Verse 56, they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on a Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Not only do they prepare for the next chapter, not only are they persistent in God's commandments, and not only are they a passive and let God be in charge, but my fourth and final point is we got to prioritize coming to church. Amen. When we don't know what else to do, it is not a time to be missing church. When your heart is broken, that is not a time to be missing church. When you had a tragedy hit your life, it is not a time to be missing church. Maybe this is just the pastor in me, but we have to learn to prioritize coming to church. Because don't we prioritize other things? Maybe that's just me and my family, but don't we prioritize other things, church? I mean, when it comes to the concert, we want to pay extra to come for a row, but when it comes to church... My bad, it's my bad. <laughs> when we've been set back, it is not a time to be missing church. Because when you come to church, we're encouraged. When you come to church, where God speaks into your circumstance. When, we set, when we're set back and we're in distraught and we're in anguish, it's a time where God can be able to break chains in your life. And I'm not saying only God, God can only move in a church. No. But when we make the sacrifices to bring ourselves to church and our loved ones to church, then God honors those sacrifices. God breaks chains. He lifts people. Things People are restored. And he can do great things that maybe we won't be able to see in our homes. We won't be able to see in our cars. We'll only be able to see in a place that is dedicated, in a presence that is saturated with his presence. We've got to prioritize. We've got to learn to prioritize Coming to church. And here I think, here's, here's where I think we, we've lost the church. I think as a culture, I think we lost it because the word worship derives and stems from an old English church, old, old English word that, that's worth ship. Because there was a time where you would worship God according to what he was worth to you. And now it seems like we only worship God when we have time. Or we only worship God when we're done with our errands. Or when we only worship God when we're in the, the, the mood to worship him. No, God is so good that he is deserving of worship all the time. Yeah. That's why they worship him nonstop in heaven. Because he is worthy of it all. And when we don't know what else to do, not only shall we get ready for the next chapter... But we don't know what else to do, and we don't know how to respond. If we read out of options and, and resources, not only should we be persistent in his commandments and be passive and let God be in charge, but also we have to learn to prioritize coming to church because he is worthy of it all. We all have been recipients of his grace. We've all been recipients of his mercy. And when we look back and see all that he's done for us, ladies and gentlemen, we can't help but worship the King of Kings. We can't help but worship the Messiah. We can't help to worship Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For everything he's done in your life, how can we stay quiet? We've got to learn to prioritize coming to church. Hey, I'm going to invite you to stand on your feet and, and close your eyes. And if you're for yourself in the season where you don't know what else to do, you don't know how else to pray, you don't know how else to pray for your kids or how else to pray for your, your marriage or pray for your household or pray for your career. Or maybe.
pray for yourself. If that's you, won't you just close your eyes and bow your heads and, and raise your hand and say, that's me. I don't know how else to respond, God. I see hands going all over the sanctuary. God, I thank you for the hands that are going up, Father. You know these people's hearts, God. And we don't know how to respond, God, but I pray, Jesus, Father, that we will learn, Jesus, to get ready for the next chapter. Because even though darkness has visited our life, even though there's darkness around us, God, we know, Father, that you're preparing us for the next chapter. We don't have to be afraid of darkness, but instead we will rejoice in it because you are with us in the darkness, God. Let us learn to be persistent in our commandments, God, because your word still works even though things aren't working in our favor, God. Let us continue, God, to prioritize our relationship with you and Jesus. Let us learn to let go and let you be in charge of our circumstance, God. In Jesus' name we pray, and the church says, Amen.